Yes, Robert. Uh, I love data, maps, and soccer. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Juan Vasquez. Juan Vasquez is the data program manager for the cities of finance, an open data and open GIS advocate, and a data instructor on nights and weekends. He's also a fan of soccer and football. We're <coughs> presenting his talk titled Open, open Data and Maps as Tools for More Impact. Please join me in welcoming Juan. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, thank you. Do you all hear me okay? Is that good? Cool. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you all, uh, to have the opportunity to talk about how open maps, or open data and maps can help lead organizations to greater impact. Um, I'll be sharing with you all between two and four use cases, depending how our session goes, and how we're using these technologies at the City of LA's Office of Finance. My name is Juan Vasquez. Um, as Courtney mentioned, I work with the Office of Finance as a full-time employee. I've been there for roughly two years, and uh, prior to that I was with the mayor's office and the private sector and a few other things. Uh, but why does this matter? Like, why do these topics even matter? You know, I step outside of the constructs of, of today's event and think about yourself in the workplace. These technologies, open data and maps, give you things like free market research. They give you access to intelligence about your audiences. They are sources of free knowledge and information. Uh, for maps, you can help decision makers, gatekeepers, obstacle creators, you can help them see the data they're used to in totally new ways. And you can also help them see data they're not familiar with at all in ways that they can perhaps build empathy and a connection with that data faster. So th there are some really kind of soft, tangible gains that come from embracing some of these technologies that are really not, not hard to use. So that's what we're going to get into today. Let me get my clicker. All right. Uh, so again, by day, data programs manager at the Office of Finance. What this means is that I am a leader in helping this 400 person Moder organization modernize itself. Uh, government is, is not modern because it's been around for a long, long time. The city of Los Angeles has been around for like 200 and something years. The formal government over 100 years. So whether it's government or a corporation or a nonprofit, if you've been around for that long, calcification builds up. Things get rusty. Things get inefficient. It's impossible for it not to. And so we're, we're this 400 person entity that every year has to bring $4.5 billion to the table to help fund things like public, uh, public safety. You know, we have uh, crazy fires. We got to put that out. We need money for that. Public infrastructure, uh, a wealth of issues that, that we have to deal with. A lot of those funds come from the, the revenue generating functions of the department I work with. Uh, additionally, I teach on topics of data analytics, open data, visualization, storytelling, packaging up products that use these disciplines nights and weekends. Um, and also, I tweet and Instagram a lot about these topics. So if you're on those social media channels and are trying to consume more of these topics, uh, you can follow me at, at Juan S. Vaz, and for the most part, I follow along. Um, I love data. I build maps for fun. My dad retired as a pilot last year, so I built him a map of the 55 countries he's traveled to. Uh, my wife and I recently got married, and so I built her a little map of all the trips we've taken as a couple. Um, I love LAFC. They play later today. I'll be watching that game. Naturally, I built a map that tracks their performance over the season. So I love data. I love maps. Uh, I encourage you all, especially the younger uh, members of the, in the audience, to find your passion projects and build, or find your passions, build projects around those topics and build a portfolio. Uh, it's been very helpful for me. And so a little bit about myself. Storytelling goes really well with data, and so got to share that. Also, before we get into it, here are two links that could be very valuable and helpful. The first one, bit.ly forward slash tools. Uh, this one is a running list of data and open data related resources. It's a public Google Doc, and so you can take a picture of this. Um, and as I come across things, I gradually add to it. And then you can see all of my classes right here, bit.ly forward slash data viz in LA. I'm slowly trying to take over that combination of SEO keywords and the interwebs. Data is in LA. All right, so this is what we're getting into today. Uh, I'm going to review two approaches 
that I have found are very, very helpful for anyone trying to uh, use maps and open data at work, but additionally just grow a data culture in their organization. So we're just going to look at two approaches, very simple, and then we're going to get into four use cases. I, will, I have them organized in what I think is a, a good order of relevance and um, interest. <laughs> And I'm going to have a, a kind of a space for Q&A after each one. So we're going to talk about what, how we've used maps and open data in cannabis legalization here in Los Angeles. Uh, we're also going to talk about how we've used zoning data, which is available through open data, to improve our business uh, lead generation and lead conversion efforts. Uh, raise your hand if you're part of an organization who has to convert leads through some sort of funnel. Raise your hand. Okay, uh, thank you. I guarantee you, those that didn't raise your hand, if you think about it enough, there's some audience in your organization that you have to put through a funnel. You got it. For us, that funnel is largely, we think you're doing some sort of business activity, maybe as an actual entity or as a freelancer, as an entrepreneur. And we want you to register with us at the city of LA's Office of Finance so you can take advantage of tax exemptions and uh, so that we can say, hey, in Los Angeles, we have over 500,000 small active businesses and more than three quarters of that, I believe, are small businesses. Like, it is important for us as a city to know where our entrepreneurs are. Uh, so that funnel is, is something that I've used our zoning open data to help perform better. So we'll get into that. And then uh, we're gonna talk about how we've used mapping and open data to help inform decisions and uh, delegation in our homelessness relief efforts. And then lastly, how we're using these tools to improve the experience for local businesses in our city. Then again, Q&A at the end or in between, or if you have a question along the way, just feel free to raise your hand and, and we'll address it. So let's get into it. First, I wanna suggest two general approaches for anyone interested in, and actually, let me, we should take a step back. Let's quickly define open data, okay? Open data is information that is freely available to anyone with either the internet access and or the physical ability to absorb it. So yes, it is most definitely the tabular and structured data sets that we share through our pub, uh, open data portals that look like big ass spreadsheets with crime information and building permit information, but open data is also the bus schedules that are available outside, the parking schedules that are kind of printed on aluminum laminate with colorful inks and like 50 conflicting messages nailed into the ground, that's also open data. So think about open data, anything that someone with internet access and a machine can access, and if it, it does live out in the tangible world, anyone with the physical ability, that, that makes it open data. And then maps, you know, you're, you're basically engaging with information through a lens that prioritizes the built environment, which is so important because I guarantee you for most organizations, their uh, end result, the thing they do, lives and, and kind of rolls itself out through the built environment, like through cities and towns and countries and zip codes and roads. That's where the products and the services live out. So some, some kind of framing for what these two technologies are, open data and maps. With some kind of foundational work there, let's talk about two approaches that I believe are very successful in helping organizations adopt open data and or maps, and really technology as a whole, but definitely these two. Uh, the first is using it as a public-facing, typically external, quote-unquote, content piece. This can be something that lives on a website. It could be something, a map, that explains what service areas a nonprofit or a school typically covers, and some of the stories from those service areas. Uh, or, you know, some of the stuff we'll explore later is what are all of the licensed cannabis businesses in the city? It is not necessarily an internal facing tool for our decision makers, it is something for the public to use. So these are content pieces that drive eyeballs towards things you care about. They can help get more donors, get more sales, get more volunteers, get more recruits, get more of whatever you need from the outside world. You can use maps and open data to build content pieces that drive that traffic. Or you can use maps and open data to build internal intelligence tools. 
So build products that people sit around and have conversations you know, with themselves and with the tool and make decisions about resource allocation and what the next year looks like. So it might not be a tool that needs to live in perpetuity. It might be a tool that you just need to make sure it can be refreshed and updated every quarter, every month, every two weeks, every six months, every year. It depends on the initiative, but it is something that you put on a table, on a screen, in a room, and different stakeholders come together and they can build common languages around these things. So for our content pieces, we're talking about things that can help drive web traffic, increase support, or help users accomplish whatever it is that you care about. On the intelligence tool, again, more internal facing, we're talking about things that can build common vocabularies, uh, improve decision making, and also enrich our data. I found this one, building a common vocabulary, to be probably the, the biggest bang for your buck. In government, we have a whole, like democracy is super messy. You need to get a bunch of people like on the same page, agreeing, or at least a grand portion of them, and many of them come from the perspective of their own business units. And so they're gonna have their own bias, they're, you know, there's like internal dynamics and, and conflicts. And so people are always talking about the same things, but in different terms. You can use data, maps, open data, to build consensus and get everyone using the, the same language so you can collectively move forward. So these are two broad major approaches that I encourage you to keep in your back pocket. And as you think about the business uh, initiatives at work or your organization, uh, you know, use this type of framing to get people on board, to develop your products or whatever, your analysis, whatever you gotta do, and, and definitely move forward. With that, yes. Yes, uh, great question. The question was, can I give an example of building that common vocabulary? Um, when cannabis became legal, uh, now two year and a half ago, two years ago, uh, we had about 30 different units within city government, the mayor's office, the office of finance, uh, LAPD, LAFD, the city attorney's office, all coming together to say, how do we effectively regulate this? Like, how do we turn policy that was approved by the voters of Los Angeles into processes, workflows, how do we wrap accountability around that? And so uh, you start, you know, we, we, I basically built, um, I, don't, I don't have it on this slide, but I built a map-based tool that looks a lot like what we'll be looking at today, and we just explore it together. You set aside two hours, you need a leader like the mayor, a facilitator who will help drive the conversation, and you need to outline business outcomes. So the questions we wanted to answer was, uh, if someone isn't licensed and they're selling cannabis, what, how can we enforce this? LAPD can go do certain things. You don't, they're hammers. If there's anyone with LAPD, no offense, but like that, that was the language that was being used. We're hammers, and if you're a business owner who is a person of color or an immigrant, and you're just selling some dime bags, which is now legal in LA, maybe you don't need a hammer to deal with. Maybe you need someone to cut your water, which is something DWP can do. So exploring options becomes super important, and uh, maps and open data can do. Does that answer your question? Sweet. I, I, there's more. Um, all right, so with that, we'll talk about cannabis. So cannabis is, is important because it's been an industry for over 20 years. It just became a formalized industry recently, but there are people's lives who have been totally built and also demolished because of this un, un organized, uh, unofficial industry. And now with it being legal, uh, you know, new entrepreneurs can come to the picture. People who had their lives ruined can kind of start over. Um, it's tax dollars for the state. It is a new industry, and with that comes innovation and ideas. Um, and it is important for us, a city who is a global leader, to do this right. And so we're gonna explore a slice of that conversation next. So what I was tasked with was helping the Department of Cannabis Regulation stand itself up. It's a department that effectively regulates and implements legal cannabis policy in the city. Uh, and there are many things they needed to do. One of them was encourage people who use cannabis to buy from uh, a legal licensed business. So what we're talking about here is, is a behavioral tweak. Um, there are many things that we wanted to do and one, one thing that really hit me was helping people through experiences and not static lists. And this is what I mean. 
when the city kind of launched its efforts and licensed its first wave of dispensaries, a natural question was, well, we want people to buy legal. How do they find the legal dispensaries, right? Like, Weed Maps gives you all the dispensaries, but how do you find the licensed ones? So effectively, the city had to become like a Weed Maps in a way. And, and this is how they did it, like a freaking list. Now, I am a consumer, um, full disclosure, I've been a cannabis user for quite some time, and when I saw this, I was slightly outraged. I was like, you government want me to buy my cannabis from someone different than where I naturally buy, and this is the option I get? I guess the expectation was that a user would get to the site and scan the address column for a closed location, and then start copying and pasting into Google Maps. And f no, forget that. They're just going to keep buying from the same source they're comfortable and familiar with. That's, it's human behavior. It's not even cannabis or government. It's just people being people. Uh, so I said, not OK. Uh, part of our effort involved a website redesign. And so I saw this as a great opportunity to use the Esri kind of, uh, Esri is a great spatial tool for building map-based applications. I was like, we can totally do this in a, a day and you know, offer a much better experience. So again, our goal, our intention in this use case was encouraging people to buy cannabis from a licensed business. And uh, our approach was facilitate the process to find the location closest to you. So let's just make that easy. And then hopefully people will decide. And over time, they will buy license. So the way we did this was by bringing this list it's our data, it's this green dot. We turn it into a map, so instead of seeing a list, you see a map, and then we wrapped it in the directions. Directions is the name of this template. All of these tools are available for free, so I encourage you to Esri, awesome technology. Uh, we wrapped our data in uh, the web app template, and then we embedded, you're gonna see all this in a second, we embedded our application in a Drupal website. That's kind of like the, the really light tech stack here. Skip ahead to a little bit over a year. We have uh, 112,000 views on the application. We've gotten really good kind of feedback. We're not running surveys asking people if they stopped buying their weed from where they used to and if they're buying license now. I don't know about that consumer feedback loop. Uh, but I know that we have a bunch of people using the tool and that at least we're not asking people to change their behavior through a static list. So my, my suggestion to you is Use maps and open data to provide experiences, not lists. Everyone can create a, some PDF or some flat list of the things we do and where we do them. Don't do that. Instead, provide an experience. So this is the application we created, very simple. Uh, I, I'm a believer of simple color schemes. This is brand consistent with the department. And what you do is in the search bar up here, you put in your address and once you do that, you get both driving and walking directions to the, to the closest dispensary to you, right? So this actually gets us way closer to the desired behavioral change we want. And so at least we're doing our part to facilitate the information. Uh, so that's what the, this is available at uh, cannabis.lacity.org. So if you want to check this out, you can embed this application. So if you do any sort of community work or social justice work, I encourage you to, to Grab these tools and, and you know, share them or put them on your website, whatever. These are some other web app templates that are available for free as part of the Esri Arc GIS uh, kind of family of, of technology. And uh, you can do a bunch of things. There's like endless templates that you can play with. You can download the code base and Frankenstein your whole thing. Or you can just uh, kind of launch the application template without ever having to touch a line of code. So very, very effective. I think, okay, that concludes the first use case on cannabis, where, again, the goal is move away from static lists, use maps and open data to provide digital experiences to help drive that behavioral tweak. We're now going to talk about lead conversion using zoning data. Any questions on the cannabis? Okay, let's continue then. The Office of Finance has many functions. Again, 400 departments, 12 divisions, 
I'm guessing somewhere around 40-ish actual business units. Um, and because we're government, we send a bunch of mail, like an obscene amount of mail. I think close to a million letters go out from our department every year, of which about 300,000 are uh, discovery or lead conversion letters. They, uh, we get a, a lead from the Secretary of State. Someone got, is doing some freelance work and they get paid with a 1099. They do their taxes, they kind of do their 1099 work. The Secretary of State sends us, sometimes, uh, you know, different times during the year, uh, thousands of records of people that are doing some sort of business activity. We get those CSV records from them, we put them through a matching process that touches a few different systems, all mostly Oracle-based databases and kind of get matched. Uh, and then whatever we don't find exists already in our, in our database, we send letters to. It's very inefficient. Uh, a lot of times we only have phys like address data. We don't have emails. We don't have, yeah, we don't have emails, so we can do kind of more targeted digital outreach. Uh, I'm, I've been trying to advocate for Twitter campaigns and Snapchat campaigns that allow you to do really localized geo-targeting efforts. We're not quite there yet. And so what we have to do is improve the way we approach direct mail. Because I don't know about you all, but when I get a, a letter from the government, uh, I'm not super excited to interact with it, and there's a chance that it's just gonna sit there until it starts changing colors, or someone tells me, like, this really matters. Uh, and so how do we effectively do that? Well, actually, um, so this is what I discovered. And, you know, all data projects, whether it's open data or you're doing something more complicated or bigger, you have to have some sort of business discovery. You have to learn about the, the process and the people doing it. And uh, I discovered that once people actually registered with us, we would be able to figure out if they were in a commercially zoned piece of land or in a residentially zoned piece of land. Um, and I mean, if you just use a little bit of critical thinking, it would make sense that people, that the addresses that are in a commercially zoned piece of land have a way higher conversion rate than those that are on a residentially zoned. You're talking about people's apartments versus stores type deal. And so it turns out like that's a good piece of information to have. Uh, we get it once someone registers at the very end of our business funnel. Being an open data evangelist and, and champion and advocate, I knew that we as a city, really, we as a county, offer an open data layer that has every single parcel of land in the county of Los Angeles, not just address and identific uh, you know, identifiers, but you have things like zoning and the year, like a wealth of just so many variables in there to work with. Uh, and so that just, you know, it, it freaked my brain out for a minute because I was like, how are we not doing this already? And then once I got past that initial shock, I was like, we have this right here. So uh, we're, we're starting to run this test where now when we get our leads, Towards the beginning of the funnel, we are enriching our leads with zoning information so we can create more targeted outreach strategies based on the zoning. So this is, this is what this looks like. In our pilot, we had uh, around 400 leads. Again, these are people or organizations who are doing some sort of business activity. They are represented by the red dots within our city boundary here. As I mentioned, we have parcels for all of the parcels in the county of Los Angeles. Uh, and so what we did was uh, a pilot that aims to maximize the data we have. And so that's my encouragement to you all in helping organizations, businesses, nonprofits, academia use open data and maps is to maximize it, approach it and frame it as making the most of a readily available resource. Organizations and businesses don't like to waste time, money, resources. If you treat data as an asset and as a resource, you will naturally create a culture that wants to maximize it. And so uh, that, that's how we framed it. We're like, this is our data. Zoning data is ours. Let's maximize that. So uh, our goal was attaching four new features to existing leads. This is the zoning and then additional details around the zoning. Our approach was enriching our leads. So we grabbed our lead, 
we mapped it on top of the parcel, and using a spatial join, we created a new lead, a new output layer, that has the new zoning pieces of data we wanted. This is what it looks like within ArcGIS Online. Here you see one lead. It's one of the 400 plus dots that were part of our pilot. And in, you know, amongst all of the features we have, you see delivery indicator as a U. That basically speaks to the zoning, and the U means, I don't know, no idea what it is. Could be commercial, could be a park, could be zoning, we don't know. Uh, and so that's what we were trying to solve for. We wanted to get this to turn into a commercial or a residential. So I first mapped all of our points, our leads. Then I brought in the zoning open data layer, which is available at geohub.lacity.org. Geohub is one of the city's open data portals. You can go get information about our uh, bus stops, uh, all kinds of really wonderful information that starts as maps. Uh, so I mapped our dots over our polygons, our parcels that are all uniquely shaped, uh, and run a few spatial joints where we basically asked the machine to give me all of the information at the parcel level and attach it to my dot, and this is what we get as an output, the blue dot that you see here. Now, I have all of the existing information that I started out with, and I also have an APN, which is an assessor parcel number. It's a unique identifier that will help with more data enrichment and, and better business intelligence down the road. And I have things like a use type, which tell me, tells me it is commercial, and uh, a description, which is a store combination. So it's probably some sort of like mixed use type structure. There's way more stuff. When, when was it built? The number of bedrooms in the structure. Great things that help our tax compliance officers prioritize and, and better target their efforts. Um, and I did this in the course of like an afternoon, sitting at my desk, using software we already had. Uh, again, ArcGIS Online, very helpful. Uh, the output layer definitely had a lot of duplicates for some of the intricacies that come with spatial joins. I think I have a screen, yes. Um, so we'll, we'll review the spatial join itself. But we started with 454 leads and ended up with 1,197. I had to do some cleaning. Um, if we're curious, I can get into the intricacies of why there are duplicates, but it was basically a, a one-to-many relationship because our dots weren't always exactly on the parcel. And so I ended up having to bring in all of the parcel information for parcels within, I think, five feet is the boundary that I set. So one lead, in some cases, generated like 100 potential matches. So that's what happened there. And this is what the actual spatial join looks like. We'll walk through these screens together really quick. These are all, again, Esri, ArcGIS Online, available for free, um, at least the free layer. Uh, there's an organizational layer that is 100 bucks for nonprofits and you know, different enterprise level pricing. When you get that layer, that kind of paid layer, you have access to the analysis pack, which is very helpful. But these tools, what you see here are my individual data layers. So I have a city boundary, parcels, all of my leads, and then I had to do my joins and batches. Uh, here we have the ability to join using uh, a spatial relationship. So every lead that is within five feet of a parcel I'm scooping the information for. And that's what generated my output layer with all of the extra information that really helps inform uh, some of the targeting strategies that we want to try. So we're, we're probably not going to waste, for the commercial leads, we're going to try doing human outreach first. And everyone that is residential, we're going to start with mail. Uh, and there's some reasons for that. I want to go as digital as possible, but that's what we're getting into. That concludes our second use case for, um, uh, and again, this one was focused on lead conversion and using open data to help inform lead conversion efforts. Uh, I don't have a test yet. We're, we're waiting for another mailing later this year to start putting some of these kind of matching practices and see, hopefully, if uh, our, our rates should be better, basically, by targeting some of the outreach strategies. We're going to talk about homelessness. I think we're like 10 minutes. Five minutes? Okay. Um, I'll stop here. We can talk a little bit about homelessness and business in the last five minutes. But any, 
any broad questions for these last five minutes before um, I move on to other stuff? So any questions, open data, maps, cannabis, zoning? No? All right, then, 10 minutes? Okay, cool. So then let's talk about homelessness because it is a huge problem for our city. It needs massive leadership. Uh, it needs more data. It needs more technology. It also needs more empathy. It needs more solutions. It needs more community buy-in and citizen involvement. Uh, and so it, it is most definitely an important topic for our, uh, for this, you know, kind of LA-focused data event. It's gotten way worse over the last few years, and uh, it is most definitely an, a national issue, but LA uh, is, is an epicenter for a lot of our homelessness uh, crisis. And so now two years ago, there was a ballot measure that passed that got a whole bunch of money to do permanent housing efforts and wraparound services. And when this was passed, we needed to get stakeholders to come together and have conversations about where are their problem areas and where should we prioritize service delivery, where are some like immediate need areas. Uh, and it, this was a broad coalition, probably like 13 different types of organizations coming together, most internal city organizations. And I was tasked with building a, a business intelligence type tool to help surface or help the, the task force explore some of the data related to homelessness in our city. So, uh, and the intention here was uh, identify locations, basically, where can we offer services out of and or where can we build housing in using existing city sources. Uh, my approach was building um, one application that brought together four applications. So the gray box here is one application that houses four separate applications, three of which, all the purple ones, are the same template. Again, no coding needed, just using the technology that's available. Um, if, you want, if you're interested in working with ArcGIS Online, you'll see them in a minute, but basically my purple boxes are called Basic Viewer. It is a very simple, clean template meant to help someone explore a map and maybe take some measurements, stuff like that. It's not, it's, it just keeps it very clean. Uh, and then the last one is Local Perspective, which helps you find how many of whatever you have mapped within a, a particular location and a radius around it. So I packed this up um, and shared it with our uh, homelessness release, relief task force and they've used it periodically to have conversations. I'm no longer involved, I'm not really sure what's come from it, but that's the last thing we'll, we'll talk about here. And so this is, we're, we're gonna look at I think two or three screens. This is one of the views of the application. Uh, what you see on the outside, homelessness data exploration and the four tabs, that is one application. That is the tab, kind of, I think it's called tabbed experience. Uh, every tab gives you a map, a website, a video, whatever you want to put there, it just gives you different tabs to share content through, and you can display it in different ways. So each one of those tabs in my application represented different data sets. And this is an example of where we just had entirely way too much data that should not have been explored all within one map-based experience. So we thought about putting all of these, I think it was like 11 different data sets together in one map, and it, it was just way too bulky. So we peeled it apart into looking at where we have um, the homelessness count, public complaints, public safety, and then lastly, city-owned real estate assets to leverage. Uh, we have things like census tracts happening here that tell us information about LAFD uh, 911 incidents, we have a sense of space so we can have conversations about is this particular area too big for what we want to accomplish? Do we need more humans? Or are there some smaller areas that we can totally tackle right now based on the human capital we have? Uh, here's the, I think it was like a city locator or the locator app. Basically what this application lets you do is put in a location set a radius from one to 10 miles, and it will give you all of the observations you have there. So if you're trying to find a vacant city-owned building within one mile of a really problematic area where you just have regular 
uh, crime-related incidents and people are complaining and there's public safety issues. Well, what do we own that is very close to that that we can use to provide solutions? This application helps you find that at a really local level. So very easy, very helpful to use there. And again, it can be embedded. So this was something that was shared with the mayor and you know, he just access on, on his tablet whenever he needed it. Uh, very helpful. You get the list of results there. That takes us to our last use case. It is the last five minutes. Any questions on the homelessness uh, use case? Just a tool to help drive conversations, facilitate conversations, um, not used in permanence, but it is just to build common language, dialogue, and help delegate. Yes? The question was, can I share some of the issues, questions, discussions that emerge from this type of exploration? Yeah. Um, things, you know, as soon as you start talking data, where becomes a supernatural question. Where are things happening? And that can range from all kinds of granularity or zoom levels. We can talk citywide down to what intersection. So people really wanted to know, for example, being a government, what council districts are most problematic? LA has 15, that's way too big. So we always try to work down to census tracts. Um, top, like most common issues, which are the most problematic? Uh, are we seeing a lot of like um, domestic violence? Is there a lot of homeless on homeless crime? That was a, a very, a thing we discovered was that a lot of female homeless individuals were being regularly victimized and so things like that start emerging. And so now you need to have other conversations that touch on sexual and domestic violence prevention and how do you treat uh, victims that have gone through that. Um, what was, uh, you start getting into the politics also where a, a city attorney might have a particular opinion on how to deal with a particular public safety issue, just like with the cannabis. Cops send a cop versus cut someone's water. When you talk about homelessness relief, that's also a, a similar conversation. Many times we shouldn't be sending cops, we should be sending people that are ready and super equipped to deal with mental health issues or more like physical uh, type of problems that are having. Um, so things like that quickly emerge. Is that, does that answer your question? Okay. Um, let's see. I think this is probably a good place to wrap up. Any other, any other questions? Yes. That's a great question. The question was, do we, as the city of LA, do we collaborate with other municipalities and agencies in our region? Yes, there are, there are numerous working groups. There are conferences and collaboratives, and we do our best to, uh, with, with LA County in particular, try to have our data sets pretty synchronized. Uh, and then I think we're, as a region, we're trying to build more common standards so we can share things with the world and people can, can work with them a little more seamlessly. I don't know that we do that systematically or, or as an organization. I know I'm always looking to learn and connect with folks that are using open data in other places and maps, but I don't think we have like an internal kind of momentum to say, hey, let's learn. Unfortunately, government is not great at being a proactive learner, and that's like a big issue that we just don't proactively learn. So we need to do more of that. Is that a good? Yeah, any, any last questions? Yeah? So uh, the question was, how do I approach the, the public interfaces for the products we build? I'm a former advertiser, so I always approach it from kind of brand alignment as much as possible. Well, what I typically build ends up living on a website or as part of an internal reporting infrastructure. So if I can, I will try to be as true to the brand and desired experience. Um, and then we will use any city standards that are a must for product development. The reality is the city doesn't have a lot of standards when it comes to product development. So if you just know, if you've done product development at scale in the private sector and other sectors, then you know it's better than the shared Google Doc that we have. Anything? Yeah. Uh, 
Um, so the question was, you know, when we talk about tools that are not there permanently, how, how did I discover that or how do I kind of come to that recommendation for you all? Uh, mostly from experience. So I used to think any tool that I build, it must be able to live without me in five years. And like the reality is, in, in government you have a lot of turnover, you have initiatives that start and stop. So we only worry about long-term permanence when it's really public facing or when we've been told we need to revisit this next year and we're gonna visit it periodically. So I've just learned time and time again, it's really something that's gonna be used for a, a set period of time and then probably be archived away. So it, it was just learned experience and I've just learned it's a good framing because organizations get stuck on the permanence. They're like, oh, we don't wanna try these tools because we can't maintain them. The natural question is, how long do you need to maintain them for? And if the initiative says two months, three months, six months, that's much more doable than five years. Does that answer your question? Cool. Anyway, Juan Vasquez, give him a hand. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, everybody. Oh, that's fine. <laughs>